Welcome everyone to the 10th uh, Oliver Campbell Lecture uh, organized by the Department of Business Research Center. Uh, uh, our, you know, the Developing Countries Research Center uh, has uh, uh, been having uh, all of the time every autumn year. And uh, I did it, so I had one in 2013. So, but uh, uh, for some reasons, we just couldn't uh, have that. But you know, we are uh, back on track in, 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 uh, in, uh, in having our, uh, the subsequent all of the time lecture here. Uh, and we are extremely fortunate, extremely fortunate to have with us uh, uh, Professor Boabe de Souza Santos uh, from Portugal, from the University of Congo, and who has been written, writing extensively on some of these issues. But I'll, I'll come to that in a, in a while. But we are also extremely fortunate because we have amongst us all those, or many of us, who were associated with the DCRs in the years gone by, including the founding director of the DCRC, wow. Professor Nandan Mohammed. <laughs> and uh, I, I, I guess everybody also, because of you know reasons that we have associated DCRC a lot with some of the charisma and the passion and the energy and the causes he fought for and the and the and the, his way of trying to give a shape to the academic agenda. It will be in the fitness of things that may I have, you know, the pleasure of inviting Professor Mahanti to the desk and on this side. No, no, may no, I? No, no, no. no, no. That is not the DCI situation. No, no, no. <laughs> but we want you. No, no, no. Please come. No, please come. No, please come. Please come. No, no, no. So, <laughs> that's not the DCI situation. <laughs> 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 but the DCI said we have many founding directors. They have only one. have a new tradition today. Thank you. Alright, thank you so much. Well, the Oliver Tambo lectures are held, as I said, almost every ordinary year. And the lecture dwells very broadly on themes related to the politics and society of we call them the third world or the developing countries or the global south. And uh, we have had nine, you know, very, very stimulating Oliver Dhammi lectures. Uh, people like Professor Mahmoud Mamdani, uh, Professor Sarad K. Patil, Professor Samir Amin, uh, Professor uh, Theodonio Dos Santos, another Santos we have had. <laughs> <laughs> and the L.C. Jain, uh, Professor John Hine, Professor Gabe Ombert, Professor Mark Jagensmeyer, and Professor Anwar Sack. And so this is, uh, we have really been fortunate in having been able to attract some of the, uh, some of the best of the minds working and thinking on issues related to the global south. So we are really, really, very really <coughs> fortunate today to have Professor Boa Ventura uh, 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 Santos, who is also very, very deeply engaged in the issues of the global south. Professor Santos is a professor of sociology at the School of Economics, University of Coimbra, Portugal, and a distinguished legal scholar at the University of Wisconsin-Madison Law School and global legal scholar at the University of Warwick. He is director of the Center for Social Studies of the University of Coimbra and scientific coordinator of the Permanent Observatory for Portuguese Justice. I, I, I wonder what, what, what exactly does this mean? But you know, maybe if you, if you have some time, you know, you can tell us. Uh, he's the coordinator of the research project, Alice. And this is something you could, you could look up on the website. And it's, a, it's a very fascinating project. And it means Alice, uh, strange mirrors, and suspected lessons leading Europe to a new way of sharing the world's experience. Financed by the European Research Council and uh, Professor D'Souza Santos has published widely on very many themes of which you know, we can only list on issues of globalization, sociology of law and the state, on questions of epistemology of which we will have some taste today, democracy and human rights in 
Portuguese, Spanish, English, Italian, French, and German. Did you write all of that or one more? <laughs> 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 so, and that is also author of uh, several books. I saw his website, there were many books in Portuguese, I cannot, that's all French to me, <laughs> and many books in Spanish as well, uh, you know, I see so this. but you know, the books in English that would make sense to you and me would be, you know, uh, one uh, that was published in 1995, to earn a new common sense, law, science and politics in the paradigmatic tradition, this is from New York, Rutledge, that to earn a new legal common sense, law, globalization and emancipation, and the third is the rise of the global left, the World Social Forum and beyond. That was in 2006. But going by one of his latest pieces that we are sending out and a soft copy to every one of you is one of his latest writings in 2012 called Public Sphere and Epistemologies of Islam. I've been struggling with this piece since the morning and I'm trying to make sense of what is that epistemological challenge that we face today. But, you know, I don't want to dwell more on this because I'll preempt his task. So I would invite Professor De Souza Santos to speak to us uh, uh, today. And uh, uh, a very, very warm welcome to you, Professor Santos. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. It's, it's really great pleasure to be here. Uh, at the invitation of my colleague uh, Dorica and uh, uh, the center. Um, I'm here in uh, it's my third or fourth time in India, and uh, this time I'm here also to work on the project um, in which I'm now involved. It's called Alice. And people, in, in, in fact, are sometimes intrigued by the name because they think that it is an acronym, and therefore it stands for something else. Now, it's Alice in the Wonderland. So the title is Alice uh, from Lewis Carroll. And in fact, what I'm trying to accomplish is in the social science probably similar task. That is to say, try to see the world upside down, try to see the world with different lenses, different concepts, different ideas, different forms of knowledge, um, to see whether something else is shown to us. Uh, but there's something new, uh, something uh, more innovative, stronger, that can develop out of there. Why, why do we need that? Well, because I think that social sciences in general, particularly in the North countries, are exhausted. There are no new ideas. We can't develop the details of the theories, of the concepts, but nothing new is coming. No breakthrough in the discipline. I'm a sociologist, I speak for sociology, and I teach part of the year in the United States. Most of the most innovative ideas in sociology came from the South, but then they were developed in the North. A good example, dependency theory of the nine members of the previous Oliver Tampa, three of them are my friends, <laughs> Mandani, uh, Samir Amin, and Tutor Dushantos. Um, so, Tutor Dushantos was one of the authors of the theory of dependence, but most people know today the system theory, Wallerstein world system theory. Well, came out of the dependency theory. So there's a sense of exhaustion, theoretical exhaustion. And I think it's also political exhaustion. It's not just a, 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 a theoretical, it's just a political one. And there is also a kind of a disjuncture between the types of theories that you develop, that have been developed and we keep reproducing, and the practices in the world. The social practice, the social actions, the social innovations today are carried out by protagonists that were not in the script of the social sciences when they were created in the 19th century. Be they Marxist or non Marxist, they're invisible. Women were invisible then. Indigenous people were invisible then, right? So we have this disjuncture, which is based on the idea, in my view, that the social theory, in fact, was developed, the ones that we know still today as predominant, as the paradigm, the canon, so to say, were developed in five countries, in, in Europe and North America, during the 19th century. How could they account for the richness of the social transformations in the global south, 
in a wider world in which we live today. Even they, if they were the best social scientists, they could not account for the diversity of the world. The world at that time was a very small world. Most of the world were colonies. They were not known. They were barbarous, unknown spaces, and therefore they could not be accounted for. So if there is a ghost relationship between theory and practice, it comes from there, forget that. It comes from other factors, it comes from there. But things are changing. In my work, in fact, I have to say that I became more sensitive to this uh, richness of the experiences in the world. When I was doing my PhD, in a, for a Yale University, you know, kind of elitistic university in the north, but doing participant observation in a favela, in a, a slum, in Rio de Janeiro. And I lived there uh, for a couple of months, for some months, to uh, prepare my dissertation. And what I saw there <coughs> was, in fact, that talking with people, because, of course, in the participant observation, you don't do interviews. We just talk to people, right? And spend the day talking and playing and all kinds of things. How wise those people were. These people were considered to be criminal, marginals, you know, uh, um, inferior because most of them were, you know, Afro-descendants, uh, while Rio was the charming city of the, the white classes, so to say, in India. And so they were really prostitutes and criminals, but inside, and seen from the inside, there was such a richness of knowledge about the world, wisdom that would come orally in our conversations, that I thought that I was missing something by just focusing on scientific knowledge. That probably, in fact, there are other knowledges that are very important. Not that I, the, the scientific knowledge is not important. I'm a social scientist. Of course it's important, but it's not the only one. And there are many people, most people in the world, go about their lives without scientific knowledge. They go about their lives with popular knowledge, peasant knowledge, women's knowledge, urban knowledges, indigenous knowledges. So, and all these experiences are wasted for the social sciences. They don't come into our canon because they are not legitimate knowledges. They don't fit our parameters of what we consider to be a rigorous objective knowledge. And this is in a in a, a brief summary, what are the epistemologies of the North? The ways in which we validate knowledge in our universities is basically a type of knowledge that is separated from practice. Well, most people never separate knowledge from practice, but we do that at our universities. We are bound to do that. And it is a great advantage to do that, but we are losing something. So this kind of knowledge is, is precious, but should be a bit more humble, to the extent that it should recognize that there are other knowledges in society that are as important as ours. Why is that as important? Because the epistemologies of the North, that is why the criteria of validating knowledge in scientific terms and the creation of the disciplines are a very specific kind of knowledge that makes all kinds of selections on the basis of which most people cannot recognize the world as their own. If you look at social sciences, us, they are, uh, how they were created, the North is the solution, the South is the problem. The South is never a solution, because the science were created in the North to solve the problems of the South, as if the North had no problems, and as if the problems of the South were not created by the North. So these conceptions of truth of representation, the conceptions of nature, as we know, the separation between natural sciences and the other sciences, the concept of rigor based on cause effects and so on, the concepts of causality, the idea of objectivity and social neutrality. Social sciences should be neutral politically in order to be objective. So the idea that we cannot be both objective and be on the sides of the struggles, on the sides of the oppressed. For so all these things, in a sense, create a world in which people don't feel at home in the world, in scientific things. They are seen as problematic, 
as objects of knowledge, never as subjects of knowledge. And I think that that is basically what the epistemologists of North have done. Through what, of course, will lots of support from two main forms of domination, capitalism and colonialism. And I come from a colonial country, colonized. The fact that I was part of an anti-colonialist movement doesn't count. It counts personally, of course. But it's the environment in which they were created that, in fact, these forms of strong domination were behind strong ideas of science, of knowledge, and of epistemology. Guns and ideas went for all this together from the 15th century onwards. So it is time to start a new conversation on that. So the epistemologists of the South, as I have been um, working on them, based on my work with social movements, I was one of the, well, we cannot say founders, but someone that was at the source of the World Social Forum. Some of you have heard of the World Social Forum. Is the idea that, in fact, there are many other knowledges in society that we should be brought into the conversation. They are not scientific knowledges, but they are important knowledges, particularly because they are knowledges born in struggle. At the universities, we only teach the knowledge of the winners. The losers never reach the university. The knowledge is of the losers. So if you want to know the knowledge of the losers, and they are very, very many, the knowledge is born in struggle, as resistance, then you have to get out and to look it elsewhere. So the idea of the first knowledge of the South is the idea of looking at knowledge forms and forms of validation of knowledge on the perspectives of those social groups that have suffered systematically the discrimination, the exploitation, exploitation, the oppression of capitalism, colonialism, and patriarchy. So it's from that perspective, it's the South. So it's not a geographical South. It's a geopolitical and epistemological South. Australia is North. Haiti is South. So it's not geography. It's a new form of imagination that looks at geopolitical and the epistemological ideas that we can get out of this knowledge is born as resistance. So the idea of the epistemologies of the sound is not just other knowledges, other productions of knowledges. And in a transition in which we are, they have to be both produced at universities and outside universities. That's the nature of the transition. And that's why I'm so pleased to be here when I hear from professor and from uh, Michael Mandulika, that we have been doing this grassroots colloquium. They say bringing in into the center social groups from outside activists, which is something that I've been doing with the popular university of the social movements. I'll be glad to talk about that since 2003, bringing together social scientists with uh, activists of social movements for two days, discussing concepts, stereotypes, different ideas, different concepts, and I'm going to give some examples of our work that we have been doing. So there are epistemologies of the South because there have been epistemologies of the North. Otherwise, we wouldn't need them. And of course, this, idea, this epistemological shift that we are looking for should be so that in a non-distant future, it wouldn't be necessary. The important thing is that they wouldn't be necessary. It's a kind of an epistemological resistance, part of a political resistance. So it responds to the first idea is that this sense of exhaustion in the North, global North, in the science of social sciences. Look at the journals in political science, in sociology. Look at the journals. The ones that I guess to rank it. Try to trace a new idea in the years there. We have specifications, wonderful specifications. Specification. Sometimes some ideas usually read it carefully where they come from. From the work they did collaboratively with the people in India, in Brazil, in Argentina, in Brazil. Because the social transformation in the global south is so rich that it's bringing new ideas, bringing new concepts. And I'm going to mention some of them. And are the ones that are renewing the canon to the extent that the canon 
is renewed, even though it is very well policed by the referees, of course. I know that no young social scientist that tries to publish an article and the referees are stupid enough not to understand what they are trying to say, and of course they are always very, very judicious, because they know that part very well, but they don't know the rest. And since they have the power to accept or refuse articles, we are at a time in which, in fact, there are forms of selection in science which are not scientific at all. And that's something that you political scientists should uh, uh, also study. But this sense of exhaustion these days is that the global north at this point, after five centuries of trying to teach the world, has nothing to teach anymore. Look at Europe now. The southern part of Europe, where I come from, Portugal, Spain, Greece. They are under IMF rule. People in the global south have been under IMF rule. Brazil, Thailand, Argentina, Mexico. And they have solved their problem. Apparently in Europe they cannot. Neoliberalism is running Europe today. Not just the IMF, the European Commission. So, are they going to teach neoliberalism globally? Well, there was a time in which one would make some distinction between the North American capitalism and European capitalism, so to say. One would be a bit more, uh, you know, a better social face, so to say. Well, the name was social democracy. And you're in the deep crisis. It's being really uh, destroyed by Trump. Rights are being destroyed in Europe throughout. But not just in the sovereign. Now in France, for instance, and we'll reach to Germany. So, they, this incapacity to solve these problems strikes me after so much experience, in which the people in the South didn't know how to solve the problems. How don't they solve the problems? The second, it is more tragic, that's the second uh, aspect of my project, and it was, you know, surprisingly enough, was accepted by the European Research Council, you showed the, the psychological crisis down there is that the North is incapacitated from learning from the experience of the world because of the colonial prejudices. Still today is very hard to accept that scholars, social scientists, serious social scientists, first class social scientists from the global south can be accepted in the mainstream in the North. They are of course the diasporic uh, scientists, but that's a different story. I'm talking about social scientists that work in India or in Brazil or in South Africa or in Ecuador or in Bolivia. There are the countries that are involved in my, in my project. It is impossible, and the idea is because, in fact, after so many centuries, accepting that we are the solution for the problem, they are the problems that we have to solve, it is impossible to get a more uh, honest conversation. So, if you take this, then we have a first idea, troubling idea, which I think is at the base of my trying to understand the problems that we are facing today. Is there is no social justice with, without cognitive justice. We have to have more justice among knowledges. South and So that we can have social justice. Because the way you formulate our problems makes that most people in the world are in the wrong part of, of history. All the concepts. Take the concept of development. When this concept of development, what, they, what does the concept create from one day to the next? Is that by four-fifths of the world is underdeveloped. That is to say, only a couple of countries are developed. That is to say, all the others are on the wrong side of history. They were made underdeveloped from one day to the next. And they were not underdeveloped not just because the economics was weaker. Their institutions were weaker. Their cultures were underdeveloped. Their laws were underdeveloped. Their habits were underdeveloped. So can we accept a concept that is created as a universal concept in which by far the majority of the world population is in the wrong side of history? That's at the core of the concept of development. So when we look at this, I think that this cognitive justice is, is part of the struggle for social justice. And if we take that seriously, 
This is going to be a transitional period that will take eh? some time. Because we live at a time in which there is a contradictory uh, dimension in the time frame of social action. If you look, particularly, I work with, uh, a lot with younger social, social scientists. For instance, they are very much concerned with ecological issues. Right? Well, in ecology today, we have these contradictory, uh, in the movements, in social movements, contradictory time dimensions and frames for action. On one side, a sense of urgency. If we don't act today, tomorrow is too late. If we don't act today on climate change, 2015 is universal. But the things that are necessary to achieve that are civilizational changes. And civilizational changes cannot be done in one year or two years. So these contradictions in time frames are in fact paralyzing many social movements and social agency. So I think we have to probably have a different conception of time or probably uh, an articulation of different temporalities, different forms of time, an intercultural conception of time, that will allow us to cope with these contradictions. So, to begin with, my, my unrest and my perplexity comes from my own research in the sense that the theories that I was taught in Germany or in the United States, didn't fit my society quite correctly. My society is a semi-playful society. It's not a developed society, for instance. And we have theories either for the developed societies and for the underdeveloped. But there are many countries that are intermediate, didn't work. Like concept of civil society, concepts of the state, the Eurocentric model, it worked differently. And that's why this uh, uneasiness, as David Moore, say, what starting point for my epistemological reflections. But then there was another context, that this is the context in which we are. These epistemological things don't arise out of the ingenuity of scholars. They arise of the social and political context in which we live, our times. And these are the ones that are bringing are the social movements, are the social innovation that takes place in society that, in my view, is forcing us to get out of the box and to try to think about new epistemologies and new theories and new methodologies. Many people have been talking about the rise of the global south. Quite an ambiguous expression. Because the global south they usually talk about may be a global south that may be reproducing the global north. Probably, maybe just other protagonists of globalization, but not a different context. Neoliberal globalization can be carried out from the United States, but also from India, from Brazil, from other countries. So when we talk about the global south, we have to understand that there are two souths: the imperial global south and the anti-imperial global south. And there is this epistemological global south, which is the one that I mentioned before. I'm interested in this anti-imperial global south that comes out of two or three different mo moments of movements, so to say. One is the disenchantment that we can see throughout Africa today and in many other parts of the world with the processes of independence. We, many countries feel that they are being recolonized. New forms of colonialism are arising of a very different type. And probably the most insidious forms of colonization is the colonization of the mind. Consultancy agencies, investment bankers, financial capital conditionalities, the idea that there is no alternative that we have just to go by this route, is a way of decolonizing minds. And in fact, it's very concrete. Because not, it's not the hegemonic states that are creating the as uh, scholars, attracting scholars from the South, are the companies, the big transnational companies, that are hiring, hiring young people throughout the global South 
out of the first degree, to brainwash them, to give them grants, so that later on they will reproduce the system. Can you imagine that most of the grants in, the, in uh, agronomic schools in Brazil are funded by Novartis? The seeds company? Why? Well, it's clear. In, in fact, one of the terms of the grants is they have to visit the Novartis plants once a year. So that it becomes clear for all these agron uh, agronomists that there is no other way of developing agriculture other than monocultures and transgenic seeds. That's what they produce. So I think that we are looking at this as a new form in which even the states are becoming non-sovereign entities. The concept of sovereignty is being shaken to the foundations at this very moment. And the interesting thing is that this is not happening only in the south, the geographical south, or the geopolitical south. It's happening also in the world. And look at what uh, corruption is in the north whenever it is legalized. It's legalized in the European Union now, and it's legalized in the uh, US. Lobbying. What is lobbying other than corruption? Legalized. Mm -hmm. So and these are really forms of transnational corporations influencing the decision-making process. So I, I think that this is part of the context, but it's not the only, the only story. The emergent countries, as yes, they have been called the Greeks, they have been called the Indies, one of them, as Brazil, South Africa, and China, they have been called the Greeks. In the last, from last year onwards, they were called the Fragile Five. I don't know if you heard the, the change, the interesting change that is taking place. And look at who, who are the Fragile Five? All the countries, except those that are not democratic. Russia is not the Fragile. China is not Fragile. India is Fragile. Brazil is fragile, South Africa is fragile, Turkey is fragile, Indonesia is fragile. Can you see? Fragility, that is capitalism, doesn't be any more of democracy. Never agreed in my view, but today it's more blatant. Blatant that democracy and capitalism are coming into a huge contradiction these days. And that's what I think some of our challenges have. But if you look at this, and there are many interesting innovations at this time that I'm not going into that because that would be another lecture about the innovations, for instance, forms of regional integration that try to fight against neoliberal uh, globalization. The ones that have been taking place, for instance, uh, under uh, Hugo Chavez and Venezuela and Bolivia, Ecuador, and so on, uh, the so called solidarity forms of regional agreements that are being taken. They are problematic. They are not pure, not at all. I'm not romantic about any of these things, but they have been an attempt to, to develop an alternative. But I'm concerning here about something else. Are the social movements that throughout the global south, that throughout the south in the north, we work also immigrants groups in Europe, Islamic groups in, we, uh, in Europe, that are very much criminalized discriminated against, and they are the South in, inside the North, according to our concept of the South. You know. They are really discriminated. What is emerging, and it became clear after the World Social Forum, is many of these social movements don't frame their struggles in Western terms, not even in the Western concepts. For instance, some of them refuse to distinguish between left and right. <coughs> Some of them don't use the concept of socialism, even though socialism, for some critical traditions, were absolutely crucial. They don't even share the idea of the modern state as we do. I'm talking about some, of course, the Islamic insurgency is one of the examples, the indigenous people's movements throughout Latin America, and I think the tribal people here in, in India, they don't frame their struggle in Western-centric type of concepts. And that's why it is so easy to demonize them instead of trying to understand 
what they are trying to say. Because our concepts do not allow us to understand on their own terms. We understand them always under, in our own terms, which of course uh, betrays the, the possibility of imagining this culture, culture otherness. So from this part, before I get into the examples, two four ideas that come out of this uh, work that I'm proposing to you. First of all, the prevalence of the epistemologies of the North as they have been developed in the disciplines have produced a massive epistemicide, as I call it. The destruction of knowledge, epistemicide. We have destroyed people, we have destroyed their knowledges, their experiences. It started with colonialism, but continues today. And we are doing that. The expert system today is doing the same thing under different names. The second idea is that the understanding of the world by far exceeds the Western understanding of the world. The third idea is that we don't need alternatives. We need an alternative thinking of alternatives. Because the knowledge that brought us here cannot take us out of here. That's why they say very successfully that there is no alternative to neoliberalism. So we need an alternative thinking of alternatives. And if you do that, probably we need to decolonize our social sciences. And this is a very hard task. I start my as professor of sociology, of course, teaching that the three founders of the social sciences were Durkheim, Max Weber, and Karl Marx. Today, I don't discard them, but I have even Khaldun. Even Khaldun lived in the 14th century and was born in Tunis and was one of the most important social scientific world. It's the Islamic tradition for the social sciences, which has been completely suppressed by the West. And we know now that Durkheim learned from him, but suppressed the source. Organic solidarity in Durkheim is based on him to come. Just an example. I could give you thousands. So, if we look at this idea of the, the South as it is emerging from the World Social Forum, from all these uh, movements that we have been identifying, and today continue, even if the World Social Forum is in crisis, we have a, a Via Campesina, I don't know if you are familiar with that, peasants from all over the place that get together and they are building a common agenda. The World March of Women is another remarkable movement, a global movement. The indigenous movement is now a global movement with lots of interaction and collective agendas. So there is a different world that is out there but it's not organized in such a way that it's becoming very visible to us and never comes out in the news. That's the other thing. In the news, other things come out, not this thing. So if you do that, then you see the following. That globalization, neoliberal globalization, which we always thought that homogenizes the world, it does to a certain extent. But that on, that, on the other hand, it fragments the world. People are not more united today because neoliberal globalizationists are less united, are more separated. Labor today is a global resource, but there is no global market, no global labor market. So the workers are more disunited today than ever before. So we have now a problem, which I think is a very intriguing and a very interesting one for social science in general. An increasingly unequal world. Never inequality have been so blatant and so almost morally repugnant as in our time. 85 people, you know the, the data from Oxford, 85 people uh, own as much as half of the GDP of the world. Can you imagine this? But at the same time, the socio-economic inequality is intensified, doubled, by cultural discrimination, by forms of discrimination based on race, on religion, on region, on caste, 
on all forms of hierarchical differentiations. And therefore, cultural diversity is not cultural, it's materialistic. Because it reduces itself, it translates itself into a kind of a political economy of oppression and exploitation. And this is new for us because many people that in the past were concerned with social inequality were not concerned with cultural diversity. If you look at Marx, even Marx, it's very clearly that for the indigenous people were a historical residue, a reactionary force, quite frankly. And, why, and that's why Marx was so big vis-a-vis -vis the British colonization of India. So, if we take this combination, it is very interesting to see that today the cultural diversity of the world is much more obvious, it's much more evident. But diversity is not enough, because diversity also creates fragmentation. If I am the LGBT, Movement. What do I have to do with peasants? That's my movement, it's the LGBT. Peasants struggle for land. Women for women's rights. Ecologists for ecology. Each one has his own struggle. His own or her own struggle and concepts and ideas. How do we get united? How we bring collective action across cultural differences? That's the purpose of my work, basically, is participate in this great new task, which is to bring collective action among different social movements without commando politics. That is to say, there is no central committee that tells me you have to get united with this and that. Those are out, those are in. Nobody today in the social movements accepts central committee commands without reasons. If I, they want to be involved in, in struggles that are risky, they want to have good reasons, their own reasons. How do we create these reasons? The only possible way as an alternative to command of politics, imposition, is cultural, intercultural organization. We have to try to understand common concerns across different concepts across different ideas, some of them may be incompatible, others are not. They are leading into the same direction, but they have different languages, different <laughs> idioms, idioms of emancipation, of liberation. And we have to try to understand where these differences are. So that's what I call intercultural translation. And I'm going to, uh, just to give you some of examples that come out of our work on this. For instance, let's start with conceptions of land. In the social movements today, across the global south, we have at least three concepts of land. People are struggling for land, but they have different concepts of land. And therefore, they organize their struggles according to different strategies. Even in a single country, you may have three different conceptions. Let's take Brazil. The land of the landless movement, the peasants movement, they have a concept of land. And that because they are landless, they want an agrarian reform. Side by side with them are the indigenous people. They never mention agrarian reform. Why? Because the land belongs to them. The land was theirs before the colonialists arrived. So they couldn't make any sense to look for a greater reform. The land is there. It has been expropriated, so they want devolution of the land. And the land, for them, is not land for us. It's territory. It's self-determination. It's self-rule. Are the ancestors, the sacred rivers, the sacred forests, which are completely absent of the peasant struggle. And then we have the Afro-descendant struggle which go back to slavery. So while the indigenous people precede the colonial state, the peasants are a political fact out of the dependence process, and the Afro-descendants come from the slave period, slavery, the Africans that were taken to. And they have their land, the land of the runaway slaves, the ones that would flee 
and would build their own quilombos, as they are, or palenques, as they are called throughout the moment. Different conceptions of land that call for different concepts of land property. We have these differences in the social movements that for some, the land belongs to them. For others, they belong to the land. Indigenous people, they don't own the land. They belong to the land. So there are different conceptions of property that are there and cannot be sold away just by saying, well, the correct one is this one. That one doesn't work. No, we have to bring together these different movements and try to see what common impulse is there. All of them want land to guarantee their livelihood, their identities, their cultures. Food sovereignty, which is the big, the big now flag for the Vietnam Pazina. Right? Not food security, food sovereignty. So there are commonalities, but they are thin. They have to be worked out. And for that, we need institutions, new institutions. They're not universities, but the universities should participate. That's what I call the popular universe of social movements. We bring together scholars with activists of social movements, of different social movements, because we have to find a second problem. The, one, the first problem are different conceptions. For instance, of land, I'm going to give other concepts. The other one, which is another obstacle to collective action, is that my struggle is more important than Women's struggle, well, our struggle is much more important than the LGBT struggle. The indigenous struggle, our struggle. Peasant struggle down there. That's precisely what neoliberalism wants. Divide and rule. The big transnational companies today are trying to celebrate contracts with indigenous people. Sometimes away from the state and from peasants playing on their autonomy. You see, so can we say that on which basis can we say that my struggle is more important than your struggle? As long as you do that, we don't get paid for it. So you have to start from the assumption that my struggle, no matter how important it is, carried in isolation won't ever be successful. So we need to bring together more struggles. We were having one of our workshops in Mozambique, bringing together peasants from Brazil, exploited by the same company, a mining company from Brazil that exploits Brazilians and exploits Mozambicans. Valdorilos is the name of the company. Mining, coal mining, the same thing, right? And we were bringing together for them to see, and in fact, that was the facility that they speak the same language, Portuguese. But we didn't bring just peasants that are being displaced by these mega projects and mining projects. We brought LGBT, we brought women, we brought women's movement, we brought uh, the ecological movement, human rights movement. And at the end of today, there were some public declarations for the press, and one of the most remarkable statements at the end was by the leader of the women's movement, who by chance is now the president, today the president of the World March of Women, based in Sao Paulo, Graça Sama, said from now on, the lands, the struggle for land is a struggle of women or something. That is to say, your struggle is my struggle. So this is quite an advancement that only through conversation we can get through this. Another example, <coughs> gender inequality or gender equality. There is not one single concept, unique concept, of equality among men and women. Different cultures have different forms of formulating them. Can feminists get together across different cultures? Sometimes they do because they follow the United Nations and uh, the, the script of uh, huge, big NGOs on the north that fund all these. Uh, uh, feminist NGOs throughout the South. But there are other alternatives. There are the people that, from inside their cultures, try to arrive at their own conceptions of equality, which may be formulated in a different type of way. And it's very polemical, because we were trained to know that traditionals 
and traditions and traditional knowledge was against women. And therefore, and in fact, it was, for instance, access to land in Africa. So, can we have different conceptions of equality? So, one of our work workshops was precisely, I mean, feminists that think, no, we are either, in this case, feminists can only work with Western centric conceptions of equality. Other than that, we are defeated. Indigenous women on the other side, using the concept of Shashawarwe. Shashawarwe is a concept in Quechua, which is a non colonial language, it's in the Indian region, to, uh, that means basically reciprocity and complementarity. And these different concepts create different styles and idioms of struggle. For instance, the women's movement in the West, or Western centric women's movement, have their meetings separately. Usual women, not men. In some very radical, not even men are admitted in the meetings. Indigenous women feminists never run a meeting without the men. And from the Western side say, well, yes, yes, still, you are still subservient to the men. What is their response? If we don't change the men, we never change anything. So they have to be here. They have to listen and so on. This is quite ambiguous. I'm not taking sides on this, quite frankly. This is one of the most difficult for me. And we don't know which way it will go. But the capacity of, of discussing these things is what I think is most interesting in our world today. The third example, human rights. Are human rights universal? I, you know, and I know, we have been discussing for ages already. We know that originally they were not universal. Are they universal today? Well, I don't think so. I think the universal, the universalism as is still an aspiration. Humanity is an aspiration. As long as there are subhumans, and we are creating subhumans all the time through discrimination, humanity is not reality, it's an aspiration. And the same with human rights. But this is a philosophical idea. I'm interested in a different thing. Can I bring together in Tunis, in the World Social Forum, human rights activists and other activists for dignity, self-determination? The people, the movements in the North African world refuse most of them to use the concept of human rights. Why do they refuse the concept? Because when Napoleon invaded Egypt, as you know, he invaded Egypt in the name and in this book of mine that just came out, I bring the declaration of Napoleon. I come here not to exploit you, I come here to bring you the human rights for the French Revolution. And then they occupied and devastated the country. So we discussed for hours which would be a common concept that could bring us together because human rights are a topic, but people are not accepting human rights under this conception, a Western centric conception. We came up with the concept of dignity. And that's why all of you that went to the page of the World Social Forum in Tunis saw the term was dignity. Dignity is a key concept for indigenous people in the pandemic. It's a key concept in Islam. It's a key concept in Ubuntu in Africa. It's a key concept in many parts of the world, probably here also. While human rights was much more polite. But human rights, after all, is an idiom that in his ideality is an idiom of human dignity, quite frankly. It was created as such, even though in a very selective way, because of the exclusions of those that are subhumans. And most of them were subhumans, as you know. So we could bring together under a conversation this idea. So this is another instance of the debates in which we are being involved that look at this. Uh, that's why the epistemologists of the South bring in a, a different conversation. There are many other things that we could go, for instance, in the concept of self-determination versus development. It's another debate that we are having today, very, very strong and very interesting. There is another debate, is on socialism. Because many of the social movements that have been together in the old social forum and outside, their aim is to build about, to, to bring about socialism. But if we deal with Islamic groups, 
or indigenous groups, they say, the indigenous people have told me several times in Latin America, socialism is another white trap. So they formulate liberation in different concepts. Can we have an ecology of liberatory concepts? In which socialism may be an idiom, but there are other idioms of liberation and emancipation. Even women don't like the concept of emancipation. I, 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 I direct a project called Reinventing Social Emancipation. And only in the project, we came to, to know that women prefer liberation, not emancipation, for very good reasons. You see, the concepts have different resonances in the movements and the people. In our monolithic ways of knowing, does not allow this because one size fits all. Human rights has to fit all, everyone. And it doesn't fit. So I think that you have that, and you have now one that apparently is also uh, maybe a current affairs in India, is the left-right department. Because all of us, myself, I have to say, was trained, of course, on the left. It's not surprising that I call myself someone on the left. And most of the, the movements in the World Social Forum consider themselves as left. But there were movements that had refused to be classified as the left or right. We are above. We are something else. Right or left? No, we don't accept that. This is Western. We are beyond that. Quite frankly, lately, in Italy, a movement very Western in Italy, called the Cinque Stelle, five stars, is a new party that refuses the dichotomy between left and right. And apparently in India, we have now a new development in this same direction. So, to conclude, what we are trying to do through these epistemological shifts, which brings in many new different concepts, which of course, I, don't, I didn't have time, the ecology of knowledge, the ecology of, of, the, of production, uh, sociology of absence, sociology of emergencies, uh, all these things that are, are part of this uh, proposal that are myself and others in my team we have been proposing, they are trying to expand and deepen the conversation of the world in such a way that some people or bodies of, of population, large bodies, are not left out of the conversation from the very beginning because they don't belong to the conversation. The idiom is different. And here, Quite frankly, we have a language problem which social science never wanted to confront. There are things that are crucial to population, large populations in the world, that simply cannot be translated in any colonial language. I give you an example of my own work, the concept of Sulakausa, which is a casual word that is now enshrined in the constitution of Ecuador. So Ecuador, the basic idea of Ecuador is to promote the summa causa. Summa causa is a, a catch-all word that means good living. Buen vivir in Spanish. But this is an approximate translation. Because summa causa is also spiritual. And one of the things that the epistemologists of the North, because our concept of rationality that came from the 18th century, 19th century, evacuated emotions, evacuate sentiments, passions, irrationalities, and of course spirituality, which is not religion. It's the possibility of knowing, identifying, living through an immen a transcendent, an immaterial element in the material world. It's not the, the other world of religion, it's this world. And I could tell you lots of stories on my work that show that this spirituality is very rich. And you cannot understand the struggles of people, many people in the world, without understanding these different conceptions of even belonging. If you are in a meeting, as I have been in Sarah, in the Indian region, or in Africa, and people tell you that they cannot decide anything without consulting the ancestors, People think, and I have gone through this and give you the example, so, well, consult your ancestors, they are dead. And then the ships around the table say, no, the ancestors are here with us. Immaterial, but present. 
a Western mind does not understand it. And when I say Western mind, be it where it is, South or North, geographical. Train it this way. It's impossible. So, I think that probably the best thing, this is most preposterous, and please don't take it negatively. At this stage, what we should try to achieve would be to be learned ignorance. They say learned ignorance is a concept, in fact, for a medieval philosopher in, uh, in Germany, uh, Nikolaus Pisanus of Kutzer. So I know that I don't know. And uh, it's not Socrates, it's, a, it's a, an elaboration of that. The world is so diverse that it is better that we know the limits of our knowledge. And therefore, up front, we have to know what we don't know and know that we don't know. If we do that, then probably a different concept, a conception of identity emerges. We desoticize, exoticize the concept of identity. We keep exoticizing identities. Because it's very important for the reductionist conceptions of universalism, out of which comes the caricature of neoliberalism. So I think that if you do that, this is a new uh, materialistic, I think, uh, I think uh, turn, which is um, one could say an intercultural Marxism, if you, if that would be not too offensive, to anyone here. Um, I think that we have to try to develop these things in order to promote other forms of collective action. Because what I'm concerned in our world, uh, our world, is that. If there are, in fact, you know, I, I'm always concerned with this, if there are so many things to criticize our world, so many things that we really think that are not going well, why is it so difficult to organize an alternative? Why is it so difficult to create a critical theory even today? We talk about the crisis of Marxism, the crisis of critical theory in general. So much to criticize and so difficult to create a critical theory and to create an alternative. There must be something wrong with this. And the same, there's one thing that probably, and I don't want to offend anyone here on this time, is that in our, funded by the Western modernity, and all of us have been victims, not in some different ways, we develop revolutionary ideas in the actionary institutions. <laughs> And universities have been the actionary institutions very often by their selectivity. Today, they are under siege, they are becoming more progressive. It's more difficult to work in them, but it's more exciting because now universities can, if they are not going to be completely mercantile institutions, transnational corporations as they want them, they call about global universities, of course. That's where we can have scientific, critical, independent. But this has to be done in such a way that cannot reproduce the past. There is not one single form of knowledge that's the only rigorous knowledge, and all the other <coughs> ignorance, superstitions, and opinions. We have to try to develop an ecology of knowledge. That's the message that arises from the smallest of the Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Jesusa Santos. Uh, we know there was one smart German who turned philosophy upside down. But today I think we got an answer to the question, what happens when a sociologist does philosophy? In fact, to the, you know, we have taken some very searching, soul-searching questions to the heart of philosophy and have done philosophy in an inside-out way. <coughs> where we have tried to redefine and you know what must be our uh, what must our concerns be how should we even engage philosophy who are we how have we been you know how have we been constituted who has constituted us you know what kinds of epistemic practices have you know have constituted us have constructed us and so on so there are n number of questions that you know, Professor Jesusa Santos has thrown over. It's actually provoked us to think a lot. There are many, many questions that leap out of his, of his deeply and very profound analysis of you know, the challenges of even getting to understand 
what epistemology has been. And although he took us on a very, very exciting journey across space, imagine what would happen if we have to go back in time, you know, with the same lens as though we stopped with the colonialism and if we have to go beyond the anyway. So, but we know that part of what we blame our problems today, they come a little bit from that, uh, you know, uh, from that um, ambiguity of the experience of modernity as played out in different parts of the world, but as they do differently, one in the north and the other in the south. The best part of this lecture I liked was, you know, the, you know, tell me a problem in the south, the south is of course always a problem, which for which a solution is not to be found in the north. I think that was the best part of it. But that was in, a, in, a, in, in short was a punchline and that which best epitomizes, you know, the neoliberal philosophy and uh, which brandishes itself under different masks, uh, behind different masks and in different shapes and forms and so on. I think, you know, but, but, the, but the deeper, you know, uh, sense and, uh, and, and the deeper punchline of the entire thing was, uh, uh, was even more invigorating for me, at least to think along. I think it is not just a critique, what, as you would know, that this was not just a critique, but it was also a very, a, a very cautiously and uh, 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 you know, a very diversified, reconstructive you know, work, which uh, uh, also places us uh, and joins upon us a responsibility of not just being able to decolonize knowledge per se. We know there was a Deku Park, there is a Deku Park who writes on decolonizing liberalism, but this is actually, you know, the, we are being urged to not only decolonize knowledge, but also to put us in a double bind. It's, you know, it's, it's, and, and, and this double or the dualist bind is, uh, you know, enjoins a kind of a dual responsibility. Those who create certain kinds of epistemic practices, so they're not rethink what they're doing. And on the other hand, others who are at the receiving end of this, you know, who are receiving this wisdom, this knowledge, so they, on what terms do they now question that, and how do, so they go about doing it. So I think, I think, you know, there's, you know, even as we deepen our understanding of what, you know, the epistemologies of the global south might look like, or how they need to be derived even from certain forms of practices, that exists in the global south, but and you know, and, and, and how do we, in, in fact, expand our universe of understanding? Very, very deep questions. Very, very deep questions. But though, at the end of the day, you know, we, uh, you know, there is there is one thing on which we are, I think, you know, we might we might engage Professor D'Souza Santos about, and one of the top questions that I have in mind is, when do we begin? <laughs> you know, must must our cognitive exercise, where do we begin? And you know, there, there is this dual responsibility of engaging with the politics and you know, bringing it up on the surface and then trying to learn from it and take it back to our epistemology. Or, you know, start with the, you know, with the challenges posed by certain kind of epistemologies and then having challenged them. I know this is, these are complementary processes. These are complementary because, for the, you know, as far as I understood, I think that these both complement each other. But there are certain issues and concerns that, you know, that afflict us and that hit us at some point of time, to which he's also not, you know, to which he's also very mindful about, you know, what we call the, you know, uh, uh, you know how do we address certain questions of urgency, for instance, and, you know, do we really can afford to have that, that cognitive luxury to play out different conceptions of justice as we even are faced with certain, you know, emergency situations, you know, people are starving, or there is a real climate change crisis and things like that. So these are issues that, you know, I think we uh, uh, we will all uh, be uh, thinking aloud. And even, you know, no one has a final answer, but we're all struggling, and that's part of the answer that he also gives. Uh, so, with, uh, uh, you know, uh, this discussion will proceed. We unfortunately we do not have all the time in the world because there are so many issues raised and very profound ones. 
So what we will do is we'll go around the table, uh, have, a, have a couple of questions to which uh, you know, Professor De Souza Santos uh, would like to, may like to respond. Followed by, uh, I think, you know, uh, there is, of course, you know, somebody who has lived this also in his own life, Professor Mahanti. You know, I also want him to, uh, you know, to uh, give a response uh, 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 to these uh, very rich thoughts. So uh, let's collect a few questions. And so the floor is open. And uh, uh, let's take uh, is a set at a time. Let's say five or six, uh, one by one. One by one. All right. Okay. Yes. Please. Please introduce yourself so that we all get to know you. Uh, uh, my name is Gita. I teach sociology at Singapore University. But now I'm doing a postdoctoral research on uh, a movement called the Right to Information Movement in India. So uh, my questions actually uh, are born by what you just said, and uh, also in terms of the kind of questions that I am looking at in my uh, own research. So I have two sets of questions and one probably is something which we are going to talk about tomorrow at JNU, which is uh, this whole question of lawmaking and political law and all that. So uh, the first question relates to this whole, uh, you know, the question of how social movements lead to or, or what kind of outcome they have. And uh, in the case of the right to information movement in India, for instance, we have seen that it has led to a policy, uh, you know, it led to a, a very, very clear, uh, you know, policy making. So there is an act which came in 2005 and so on. And very interestingly, the thing is that when we talk about, you know, you said that uh, resisting the colonization of the mind. So social movements do that in, in a sense. So when we talk about that, in what sense we uh, see that certain social movements also set their agenda? Because if they are resisting the colonization of the mind, in what ways that translates into agenda setting? So uh, that's the one thing, and how that also leads to you know uh, lawmaking, which also the, the question also is that how do we then talk about the state when we uh, when we look at the outcome of the social movement? I mean, it need not be an outcome, but that's that's one question. The other question I had is uh, which relates to basically your uh, whole idea of epistemologies of the norm. Now, uh, when we study social movements, for instance, and this is one of the questions that I'm also going to look at, which is that, uh, what about you know the notion of leadership? How do you characterize social movement? I and mean, when we talk about the social movement, we say that it, it has to be temporarily enduring. That's that's how you talk about the social movement. So how do we then look at, for instance, and these are coming from the epistemologies of the North, in the sense that they have told us that a social movement has to be understood like this. There has to be a leader, there has to be a gender, there has to be it should be temporarily enduring and so on. So how do we then look at a social movement? I'm just thinking about uh, you know two very recent you know movements, quote quote unquote, which is the India against corruption, which led to the Amadmi uh, party, as you know, and the other thing was the December 16 Delhi gangway, which also was seen as a protest, which uh, you know uh, I think uh, some like somebody like Gloria Steinem has also talked about it and. Uh, so the question is, yeah. So, uh, so the question is that if the epistemology of the North tells us to look at something like that, how will scholars we then, you know, uh, challenge it? So this is very preliminary kind of things because I'm working on the yeah. thing. Right. You, Smriti. So yes, Krishna. Yeah. Uh, I'm Krishna Murari. I'm pursuing my masters from the Department of Political Science. So I have a very fundamental question, like creating this north and south dichotomy, <coughs> isn't it a colonial creation in itself, like looking at it from a very dualistic point of view and uh, ignoring the east differences between the east and west also? This is just, that's just struck me so direct. Next question. Uh, I have two questions, sir. Uh, first one is about how would you differentiate between social and cognitive. So there is a difference in your lecture. You have differentiated between social and cognitive. So please justify that difference. How would you differentiate? And the second thing is, in your lecture you argued in favor of collaboration of different sort of social movement. But my question is, uh, Yes, social movements are there against the neoliberal uh, part, 
but at the same time this collaboration uh, what 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 are the ways through which this collaborations of social movement who try to escape itself from the national collaboration it means it could be uh, overlapped by the national so Yes, Vikram. Um, a couple of things. First, um, I think uh, historically there are some issues with the talk, especially about um, the argument about how the Western system is rational. I think uh, if one looks at historically how Dutch colonialism emerged, the archive reveals to us a deep investment in the affective. For example, notes after notes in the archive are filled with the question about what is the legitimate affective relation of, say, Dutch men who had sexual relations with women in the East Indies and the affective relation between the parent and the child that produces from that account. And this is within the bureaucratic framework as one would have it. It's right on the registers there, it's right on the notes, it's there in the archive. So I think this, uh, this rather sort of simplistic reading of colonialism as an overtly rational project needs to be problematized. I think the same thing emerges with accounts of the civilizing mission in India, where the missionaries are constantly invested affectively in the native informants and the native questions. So I think that dichotomy needs to go. Also this other dichotomy between the structure of the academy and the agency of thought. So, the academy is overpowerful, over structural, nothing can be thought in it, the canon is so deeply devastating of all knowledges, yet our thought somehow remains in its pure abstract sense, so possible to think of the new. So our thoughts somehow remain abstract, our thoughts remain uninterpreted, our thoughts remain non-structured, and I wonder where does that come from. And finally, I, I, I sort of have a problem with the cognitive justice bit about what it involves. First, um, perhaps it's a question of training. So we've got bad training where we, have, we aren't able to deal with the agency of the object of our field. But we also recognize that the agents of our field are necessarily progressive. So that there is a deep right-wing movement within even the queer movement in India. Right, so we then go on to the subject as say, the object that we face is one of victim. That that's again problematic. Again, but I think I think you're not faltering the boat. So there is a certain, I think in a certain sense, your thought already has the object of its thought discovered. So the object can be found in the global south. The object know, knows what it's going, it is going to give to us in terms of epistemology. And I think perhaps this comes from a very Judeo-Christian ethic, where the object is unknown. But the ethical responsibility to the object sort of prefaces the argument. So this is both in, say, the Christian ethic of facing the other, and especially through Levinas in uh, the sort of Judeo-Christian that. So perhaps a certain sort of Judeo-Christian ethic, and not perhaps the politics, uh, plagues the talk. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. And then, uh, maybe come back for more. Well. Uh, in a talk like this, of course, there are all kinds of microcodes and, uh, and uh, it is impossible to address all the issues and I'm sure that some of the formulations may be misunderstood and, uh, and we have to be, you know, uh, in the mood of starting a conversation. And because all of us always talk of, you know, from our own experiences and, uh, and um, I am very pleased by all the questions that were posed to me. Uh, the first one, um, yes, uh, there are two uh, parts of the question. And, and the first part, in fact, I'm going to address it tomorrow. So I'm going to address the questions of law can be used by the social sciences. That's the title of the talk. Can we occupy the law? Can the movements occupy the law? It's a big issue. We have been discussing that for a long time. And, uh, and uh, I'll, I'll leave that to, 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 to tomorrow, I, I think, um, if you don't mind. Uh, the other things is that 
the new the new movements, if they are movements, I mean, you, you say, and it, it's, yet I know what you are saying, because I think it's very precise what you are telling us about the sociology for these social movements, traditional social movements in, from the US till the Columbia School, the most recent one, which are still in and so on. Well, what we are facing today are with uh, things that don't fit those uh, uh, theories. Uh, neither the causes nor the forms of the movements, they are different things. Uh, I myself uh, even prefer to get rid of the social movement literature, which I used previously, of course, and this is a growth process that goes together with our own work, is that the collective presences, you know, because these people have been analyzing the, the protest movements, the indignados movement in Europe, the Occupy movement in, uh, in New York and other cities, the protest movement in Arab Spring, the protest movement of students in Chile, and the protest last year in Brazil, or the Mexico movement one, two, three, which is a different uh, type of movement about electoral politics in Mexico. They are very different. I mean, from all these genealogies of social movements, and uh, one possibility is to say they are not really social movements. They don't fit the characteristics. The other one, the effect of endurance and of new concepts of leadership. Because everybody says that these movements are a bit anarchistic, in a sense, right? And in fact, many of them even claim that they are anarchistic movements. And that's an interesting point. Because Gandhi uh, once said, and it's very profound, that he has read all the Western theories, a political theory. The one that he was closest to was anarchism. They said that. If I would have to choose a Western theory, I don't want, but if I have to, Robert Nyakin and his, well, his conception of the state and so on probably had to do with this. So this uh, anarchistic tradition, which has been suppressed for many ages in, uh, in the global north and south, I think the last appearance was 1936-39 in the Republic of Spain, right? Um, it's emerging. But it is not also anarchist. It's a different thing. Anarchism also had, you know, the two lines, the more, you know, uh, violent one and the non-violent one, right? Of course, the, the, the relationship of Gandhi with anarchism when he came to Europe to study law in England, he didn't like the anarchism, the violent anarchism. And at that time, in London, in Paris, the anarchism was the, the violent, the bombings, right? Um, so there was not that. But he wanted the theory in itself is a pacifist theory. Well, Tolstoy is an example of this type of pacifism, which is very much related to Gandhi and even to Tagore. So I think that we have to see whether we can understand this innovation in society with new concepts with new forms of social theorizing and probably with new productions of knowledge. What is basic here is that studying with them and not studying about them. I know that we have to write dissertations. And dissertations are exercises in writing about, not writing with. But I don't know, in the future, there are many novelties. The universities are innovating a lot. One university in Brazil, for instance, just one of my examples of my own work, a student that wanted to do his PhD in collaboration with social movements. In this case, peasants movements, landless peasants movements. And then he really worked with them. And the thesis is the kind of an ecology of knowledges, the scientific knowledge and also all the knowledge, they are not just interviews, they are evaluations of life, of society, and so on, by social movements. And then the problem, the problem arose. Who is going to evaluate this dissertation? Only professors? With academic degrees? Well, the University of Sierra in the Northeast Brazil allowed for the first time in the committee the leader of the social movement, Landa Social. And believe me, it was a brilliant defense. With argument, it was not to defend the thesis, 
was some different of a man, in this case of a man, almost illiterate, but knew very well the reality that this student was. So at a university, that is to say, it is possible, the universities, because they are not training the elites anymore. They have to find the social basis. That's all my, I have written several pieces on the university, probably. I could send them to you. Because now the elites, I mean, if you look at the very elite, the, the ones that control the economy in India and Brazil, they send their children to the global universities in Chicago. They, they don't trust the universities. Sometimes they start with high school, not to have any problems right, of contamination. So the university, most of the universities in the world are not training the elites anymore. So they have to have a different source. That's why they, there is a fiscal crisis at the universities. The public, the state is not interested because the state has been captured by these global elites. And they are not interested in universities that are very often troublemakers. Universities in Brazil, half of the year, last year, were on strike. The UNAM, the most prestigious <coughs> university in Latin America, the University of Mexico, where almost 2,000, 200,000 students, was on strike for three years. But they achieved a very interesting reform of that university. So I think things are, move, are moving. It will take a long time to do this. We are talking about, in fact, we are kept, all of us are caught in these contradictions of time frames. My own work, I see my own self, and as a citizen, the sense of urgency, and at the same time I know that these things, these examples are what I call, I'm, I'm in my work, sociology of emergencies. That's why I mention, I amplify symbolically these emergencies. So that people look at Northeast Brazil, this university. If they did, could we do the same? Could we use that precedent? That's what I call sociology of images. The second question is the, you know, well, there are some conventional questions in there, I better respect that. Uh, because there is no way of getting rid of the of dichotomies without starting with them. I mean, that's the constructive part. What I what, I, what you have seen in this, uh, my talk, very importantly, is that there is a deconstructive part, but then a reconstructive part. I don't believe in deconstruction. The very postmodern French David I am type of idea. If we deconstruct everything, we deconstruct resistance against oppression. So we have to reconstruct in different models. How do I reconstruct? I start the first sentence probably, with, you didn't uh, pay attention to that. The epistemologies of South are there, so that in a non-distant future, they won't be necessary. I have to start from what we have. And we have this dichotomy, which is in fact is being reproduced all the time. And more so now, in economic, political terms. And that's why the CIA is so concerned. I would advise you that would be another lecture. But Look at the National Intelligence Council, which is the most prestigious research center within the CIA of the United States. Every four years they, they produce a report. Global, you can go to the web and uh, download this document. Called the Global Trends 2030. What they say is that North America and Europe are shrinking and they are losing ground because the South is expanding. They now are 56 percent of the global GDP, 2030 they will be 25 percent of the global GDP. So we have to defend this. If you read that report, you understand something. Because they say that, that spying is part of the defense of the global. It's there with people don't read the CIA reports, and particularly critical scholars don't like to read that. That's the most important knowledge that we can have. Much more precious sometimes than a chapter. So they know that they are in this dichotomy because they want to reproduce it because it is the basis of this, what we used to call, the Trotskites at least used to call, an even and combined development. We know that there are developed countries because there are only developed countries. The plundering of natural resources, what is, what is that? 
It's the same. Except now there are new protagonists. That's why I was very cautious about this. One of the concepts that has been developed in the South, that is really a Southern epistemology, because it was based on the realities of the, in this case, Latin American South, is the concept of sub-imperialism by a Brazilian scholar. Nobody teaches that. It's crucial. I don't understand the role of South Africa in Africa without the concept of sub-imperialism. Of India in Africa. Of Brazil in Africa. They are not countries. They are southern countries. But sometimes they reproduce the worst aspects of global neoliberalism. There is no distinction between the mining company for India and the Canadian company. They are doing basically the same thing. So where is the global south? That's why I say global south is a mystifying concept. It may hide all kinds of ambiguities. But that's, in order to criticize and build an alternative, we have to start from a, this unequal dichotomy. Because the problem of modernity is there is no equal dichotomy. All the dichotomies, uh, uh, dichotomies occult and hierarchy. Men and women, society, nature, body, soul, all of them. Right? But I have to start from them in order to deconstruct them and in order to build an alternative. So, I, I, and I, you are right. Uh, why the West East doesn't show up? Well, it is very, in my work, of course it does. We are always used to the, this. You know, as well as I do, north-south related to the socio-economic world, and east-west to the cultural one. Right? Well, what happens when I said that social economic inequality now is combined, fused with, travestited as cultural differentiation, the east and the west are being fused with north and south. And this the combination it is complex, and it's more interesting now. Because in many aspects, some of the Eastern aspects of culture are becoming hegemonic. But economically, still neoliberalism is globally an hegemony of the North. Where, like any global capitalism, uh, you know, uh, always relied on local elites. What is China? Is an alternative to the global north? Well, there are features of this development in China that are quite anomalous. First of all, it is a sovereign project, the only sovereign project of development, if you want. State control, absolute control of currency. No other country has that. Is this socialism? No. State capitalism? Nobody knows. So, the global side is very differentiated. So this innovation is also the text. And if you read the text, translated in my case in English, because I don't have access to the Chinese, Confucianism comes very often into the justifications. So you put Confucius to justify what is being done. And that's all the literature in China about human rights, downgrading them, putting them aside, because there are always two sides, the critical side at time, uh, advocating as an activist of human rights myself. That's something. Human rights are not sufficient to me because they are small. I want a more expansive collective rights, for instance. That's my, my problem with, uh, with my, my, you know, a person that I am, I want like a, a martyr. It's not individual issues of, of human capabilities. They are collective rights, collective problems, structural problems. You have to approach from a different perspective, right? So, I think that these dichotomies have to be worked out in such a way that to identify what they formulate and what they hide, so that we can like, move forward. But as I say, this is a long, long time. It is. It's not easy, because all our minds are framed like that. And it's very, it's very big. But in my view, I'm, I'm trying to be aware of that. Well, uh, I'm not surprising that, surprised that um, this differentiation between social justice and cognitive justice uh, uh, is intriguing uh, because we uh, have been used to the idea that there are truth is representation, right? 
truth in, in the epistemology of no. Truth is the representation of reality. Maybe realistic or constructivist, but it's a, a representation. So I have the knowledge that tells me about the reality, social injustice or social justice. Why do I need cognitive justice? Because the criteria by which I represent that reality do not allow me to do two things. First, to identify other dimensions of social injustice that have been hiding, that we don't pay attention to. And we have a record history behind us. Slavery was not social injustice. The inferiority of women was not social injustice. It was in fact justice in Aristotle. Because they were inferior. How could they have social justice if people are not equal? That's where, when we start to do things in retrospect, you can see that probably the lenses through which you see the social injustice have to be adjusted so that we identify other things. The lenses, the lenses are our knowledge, our concept. And therefore, I need other concepts and other kinds of knowledge that will identify other forms of injustices. Because for us, we are trying to see that justice is among equals. We have to deal with justice that people are, in fact, formally equal, but are materially equal. That's all the theory that we have. Liberal theory is about that. And even Marxist theory is not very different. The problem is that our knowledge represent to us a natural view of equality, formal equality. We are all human, we are all human. But then, there were all these subhumans. They didn't fit, what well, I call them the visa line. They were not considered equal because they were not part of the problem. They were not considered within this representation. So I have to change the lenses to see from the other side. And when I see from the other side, I can see a, a, a reality. I'll give you an example. This may look abstract to you. 19th century, the end of 19th century here. And then comes here even with some repercussions here in Indian British colonies. <coughs> labor laws that are introduced. The labor laws in the metropolitan societies are the most facilitated, protected laws that we had in 19th century. Because in labor laws, we know that the capitalist and entrepreneur and the labor and the worker have very equal power. It was the first time that in legislation and politics the inequality, the material inequality was recognized. They are equal citizens, but one is worker and the other is entrepreneur. They are not equal. Labor law tends to neutralize the inequality by protecting the, the worker. All the labor laws are to protect the worker against the entrepreneur. That's why the labor law departs from civil law. From the lawyers that are here, they can understand, right? What was labor law in the colonies? Forced labor. The labor laws in the, in the, in the colonies was penal. Mm -hmm. So if I take the concept of labor law and use the metropolitan concept, I can have, never understand the types of labor laws that were created in the colonies. At the same time, at the very same time, the labor laws in Africa were forced labor. People that were forced to labor, to, to work for the roads, to pay the taxes, and so on. So you see two concepts. And if I take the concepts of law that were developed in the north, I don't see the reality of the south in the colonies, because I don't see the colonies. Because the theory, was paying attention to the metropolitan societies and didn't account for the colonies. So you see, that's why the cognitive justice to bring the other side. So knowledge that come from the perspective of those that suffered the oppression resulting from that omission, that absence, that we are, they are not part of this. They are not workers. They are colonial people. You see, since they are not workers, they are not part of labor laws. That's why labor law here could be penal, and there was facilitated. So that's this uh, this thing that forces us to have other instruments, other cognitive, other concepts to allow for this. 
but as I say, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a long, uh, long process. The collaboration among social movements, for what? Well, I, I think that uh, this is a good point. There are many people that, that think that uh, probably collaboration with, uh, and in fact was the condition, collaboration among social movements and it is uh, a way of weakening, of weakening the movements, of strengthening. Well, let's take the uh, labor movement. When the World Social Forum was created, the labor movement didn't want to integrate the social movements in the World Social Forum. Because they say the labor movement is the privileged struggle. We are in capitalist societies. Therefore, the worker movement, the workers' movement is privileged struggle. Women's movement, well, it's, it's nice, but it's not important. LGBT, gay movements, this is pretty. So you have an idea of what is uh, an important struggle and the secondary struggle. Look at the workers, the, the labor movement today. It has been this month in many parts of the world. Look at what's, what's happening now. What's happening now is that other movements, you know, the, the other movements that are emerging are workers' movements. Gay movements are workers' movements because they are workers or unemployed people, but they don't present themselves as workers, but as gays. Women's movement, they're working women or women that want to be, probably in the movement, but they present as women's movement. So the idioms of struggle, the narratives, the, the formulation of struggle change. And if this change is possible, is possible because it is possible to make these collaborations. Because if I take an essentialist view that gay movement is here, women's movement is there, and there's, there's no collaboration, then that's what they want. They divide, and, and, and they keep dividing, in fact. There are some troubling uh, uh, developments today. For instance, in the European Union, my project, I have to have a ratio of men and women in all my invitees. And it's, sometimes it's difficult when you come from the division of social sciences. There are more women today studying social sciences, but the leading figures of social science are almost men in many countries. How do you combine this? So the, the women's movement in Europe managed to put these conditions on that. But this is a Europe that is being devastated by neoliberalism these things together. So these are part of the questions Well, I think that collaboration is in fact needed. Well, the last questions, yeah, well, they are very well taken, of course, uh, but um, it is easy for us to problematize everything. You know, it, it, it's, it, you know, we can problematize rationalism, we can problematize uh, colonialism, we can problematize north-south, we can problematize uh, our training and so on. I think that the problem is to say, as I said, how do we reconstruct things? Because nobody is going to be happy with just, you know, destroying things. This is the cynical view. No social movement activists can afford that. Because they cannot afford to be cynics. Because they have to feed their families. They have to protect their land from displacement. They cannot say, well, this struggle does not, is not strong enough to, to fight against capitalism, so let's not fight it. They have to fight it tomorrow. Otherwise, they will be displaced. LGBTs have to fight against police oppression every day throughout the cities in this world. They are being massacred in some countries today. In, in not uh, just in Africa, as usually people mention. Not just Brazil, for instance. There is a massacre of black people in Brazil today, in not these cities. In Bahia, which is probably the most uh, Afro-descendant population. Every day, 12, 10 youth, black youth, is killed by police. That's the level of violence. So I think that in order to do that, I, of course, colonialism has to be diversified. You know, you know imperialism has to be diversified. We have, you have a fabulous historian, Sobramaniani, who is the professor in Los Angeles, that even when analyzing Portuguese colonialism and imperialism, spoke about three empires. And they had very little in common. 
They were colonialisms, yes, but they were very different. I always say that uh, Christopher Columbus brought from, from America parrots and seeds and plants. Vasco da Gama brought from India ambassadors. So the two colonialisms cannot be the same. Atlantic Ocean was unknown. The Indian Ocean was absolutely globalized when the Portuguese arrived here. In fact, they needed a Swahili pilot to get to India. Otherwise, you would never get here. You see? So these are the, the complexities. We know that. But there is no way of saying that since colonialists are different, they were not colonialists. No, they are all violent. Because they are based, they are violent. Why? Because in the metropolitan societies, we have a dichotomy. I can refer to some of my books in English, in which you know, I developed these ideas. The contradiction is with regulation and emancipation. There are always movements, and when a regulation is in crisis, there are emancipatory movements, socialist parties, communist parties, and so on. In the colonies, the dichotomy is not between regulation and emancipation, it's between appropriation and violence. We, we, we exercise violence, but not to a such an extent that we destroy all these people, because they are needed of this land, for instance. Appropriation and violence. Always in tension. So that's why there is this line between the colonies and metropolitans, and social sciences were created as if they were only metropolitan society. And that's why there was a separate science for the colonies. That was anthropology. Today, anthropology is completely different. I mean, it's nothing to do with history, but it has to do with history originally. Right? So I think that the Judeo Christian. Uh, well, I take the argument. I, you know, I, I, I don't see the, the traces of that in this kind of theorizing, uh, particularly because I think that I'm, I'm trying, that is another discussion, uh, to develop other conceptions of this spirituality that I mentioned. And these forms of spirituality, as I mentioned, has nothing to do with Judeo, with Judeo uh, mentality. Because they personalized the entity of God. And I work with indigenous movements where the gods are the rivers, are the mountains, are the forests. And that's why the missionaries, when they arrived here or right in Latin America, they could make sense of it. How are you going to missionize these people? If you come to my university, and I'll show you the book where one of the Jesuits tried to translate God into Tupi Guarani, which is one of the indigenous languages, is a 600-page book. It couldn't make sense, so yet went on and on and on with the difficulties of translating a personal God, an entity, ambiguous in itself, because one seed of it is a trinity, or can you have a God that is three? Right? We have four categories. Huh? Godfather, Christ, and then the Holy Spirit. It's even more confusing for Indians that have no personalized idea of religion. In fact, you take Hinduism, you take Buddhism particularly. There you see very interesting connections. That was seen in the 19th century. Take a great philosopher that was in fact the inspirer of Nietzsche, Arthur Schopenhauer. Where is he going to get his ideas about it? religion is from Buddhism and Hinduism. They knew this scripture. Even Spinoza knew that. But this part of learning from the Indians, <coughs> that's why this was very important. You go on enough, so I will tell you that even the theories of Kepler today, you know, about the, the, the solar system that we have today, and uh, the critique of Ptolemaic system, there are many serious scholars in this country, and also in Singapore, one of them works in Singapore now, that show and demonstrate that Kepler's theory and Tycho Brahe's theory, that they are the president of Galileo, are all of them in Sanskrit texts that were made available to the Arabs. And Tycho Brahe used those texts. So after all, a Western discovery is in fact an Eastern discovery that has been suppressed. 
Sanskrit texts, of course, which I don't. So these are people that are scholars, specialists. Make these arguments today. As they, we know that Latin America was very well known before the Portuguese and Spaniards are right there. There are maps from the 14th century and 13th century, very well detailed. But we still teach that the Portuguese discovered America. Or the Spanish. Other people were there. And we have seen already remnants of boats from, from China, in the Pacific Rim, in the Pacific coast of Chile. They are there. But more than that, there are maps that are detailed. So someone was there before. But there was a time in which the hegemonies in the world were, were different. I mean, Asia was absolutely dominant until 1500. Read the CIA report, my dear. The CIA says precisely this. Asia, in 2030, will become again the hegemony, the hegemon of the world, which it lost in 1500. This, all, this may not be true. But how, how serious and how concerned they are about losing hegemony. And if we unravel that, we know that zero was created here. Was zero was a, is a creation of Indian scholarship, civilization. You know, the Western discovery. And I can tell you that books are there, if just to read. Why in the 14th century, 13th century, the merchants in Venice were at odds to understand the zero? They didn't understand the zero. And you know why? Because zero value is nothing, right? Zero. But when on the right of a number, increases the value enormously. On the right of one is 10. Two zeros is 100. How some, something that values nothing in itself <laughs> brings so much value when added to others? We are talking about the 13th century. See? Of course, these histories are suppressed because they are not part of the canon. If I would teach them what I want, what a young social scientist at my university, they would fire me. <laughs> <laughs> Bad scholarship. What was that? Did you have accepted on Sanskrit texts? Who is these guys that are doing that? Do they have PhDs? <laughs> well, the work uh, uh, that I'm referring to you is uh, being uh, in print in India by a good friend of mine uh, from Goa, actually, Claude Albers. He's a great sociologist of knowledge that decided not to write any more books. But you can see there, many of these things, there are other authors that are now in Malaysia and in, in, in Singapore, try to reinvent social sciences from the Asian perspective. I'm not saying that all very good. I mean, I, I'm not. Who am I to judge that? But I'm part of that offer. And I'll be there in August precisely to have these dialogues. And it's very interesting. Up until now, nobody would think that this would be possible. Philosophy was Western. From Aristotle to now, indigenous people, did they, they don't have philosophy. They have cosmovisions. The, in, in India, Hinduism, they have religions. They are not philosophers. Because philosophy was because we, we the North, and the power to define that philosophy came from Greece. When we know that most of the philosophical thinking of Aristotle came from Alexandria and from Persia, they say from Africa. And the philosophers were much more darker in skin than the statues in the British Museum. Sure. Uh, for uh, we won't have any more questions uh, because I suddenly realized that I cannot de deconstruct time anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, <laughs> reconstruct it back again. So, uh, uh, I just. Unless uh, they're about when they say. No, I, I, I think. Uh, okay. Because I, I think we, uh, we uh, ask uh, Professor Malti to have some. Uh, you know, uh, some uh, last thoughts on this and to share his own insights. And, uh, and then Dr. Madhurika Banerjee will uh, propose a vote of thanks, some of which we are uh, very much done. But it was tremendously exciting to listen to the sheer breadth and depth of, you know, all that uh, we had to listen to. The, the lectures have not been printed out. Usually they are, the Oliver Temple lectures. It's just because we had it in the last minute, we fixed it up. And so once we 
get them. But we must get them. Yes, yeah. we will. We will, we will uh, the first them. lecture is not printed and distributed. Right. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Or else we use it. Right no innovation. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I think this was quite a celebration of uh, the DCRC legacy, DCRC spirit, because these are exactly the questions which have prompted the uh, the idea of DCRC, uh, even before DCRC was born formally in 1993, even before. I think uh, many of you as students would remember that uh, these are the issues and uh, which have uh, troubled us, uh, similar issues. Uh, I think I take away the concept, epistemocide. My God, uh, I mean, I have, you know, we have toyed with uh, all these questions for so long uh, because this is the most fundamental articulation of the project, of the, of the argument that the knowledge systems uh, which don't merely give us categories or give us theories about knowledge but also give us canons, give us principles of validation, give us the definitional <coughs> methods of what is knowledge, how to evaluate things, how to describe things. Um, remember <coughs> we had, uh, had uh, Ngugi here in 1996. And uh, you know, the, his uh, similar project, I think the, the same project. Uh, and uh, uh, that the, the, the colonial um, regimes had destroyed our imagination, our capacity to name things. But I think he goes a step further uh, when he talks about uh, uh, the, the dominant Western, I would still say Western, Western epistemology, which not only delegitimizes, uh, which has destroyed, ignored, um, uh, and doesn't recognize the existence of the non-Western epistemologies, theories of knowledge, categories, and so on. So I think that's one concept we carry with us. And how, as you put it, uh, uh, alternative thinking about alternatives. Uh, in fact, that's what we call creative theory. This group is called uh, you know, practitioners or uh, sort of participants in the making of creative theory. That uh, critique is critic of dominant uh, knowledge. Alternative still is keeping the dominant knowledge in front and finding alternatives. We want to go to streams of practice and knowledge around us all over from where we start our thinking and doing. Uh, and uh, therefore, that ties up so well. Um, well, I have so much to say, but there's no time. We, we have toyed with the idea of people's rights as an alternative to human rights to precisely uh, tackle the kind of questions uh, you have uh, raised. Now, two problems that we have encountered in our journey, uh, responses to which you have indicated, but uh, I think that's what we have to uh, think about. Uh, one is that uh, the social movements in India have been uh, have experienced uh, processes of incorporation into the mainstream, uh, and uh, the state or even global capital has uh, picked up the language, picked up the discourse of social movements. Uh, this we have seen in the environment movement, in the health movement, people's health movement, in the women's movement. Uh, and when, uh, when World Bank, UNDP, uh, you know, uh, talks the same language uh, as uh, the social movements, uh, and gives us the impression that now we have won, uh, and you know the uh, global capital has accepted. I mean, this this is the nerve. Now, um, this has disarmed much of our uh, militancy, our modes of operation, uh, so that's, that's one problem. Uh, and uh, because 
that is actually not uh, alternative epistemology. That is not the liberation epistemology. That is still the dominant epistemology adapting itself to us. And you are not talking about adapting the concept of democracy to Indian conditions, the concept of capitalism to Indian conditions, socialism with Chinese characteristics, uh, or democracy with Indian characteristics, and so on. Uh, it's much more than that. It's a fundamental reconstruction. I like that word. Reconstruction of categories, knowledge, canons, validation approaches. Uh, uh, and, and that's why, you know, uh, we, we wanted to talk about creative theory, keeping that in mind. That it is, uh, it is a fresh start. You know about the dominant epistemology, but you are not merely reacting or critiquing or finding alternatives to the dominant. You are making a fresh start from practice, from what you uh, have around you. It's true that even to look at them, we, we are carrying the lenses given to us. But if you know that these lenses are colored, then you have, uh, you have a liberating possibility. That's one problem. The other problem is uh, about the intersectionality, the integration. We have toyed with this in theory, writings, practice, uh, through our, because some of us are in so many movements together. Uh, and uh, therefore, uh, actual interconnecting roads, uh, several of our friends, uh, including some of us, have, uh, have tried to play. Uh, but in that, you know, the capacity of global capital and dominant state to highlight the exclusiveness of one movement, one issue, one group, one section and its right is so much that uh, it has been difficult to uh, integrate that. So it is either you totally ignore the sectionality, I mean, today the corporate uh, media has interpreted the present phase of Indian politics as transcending divisive politics, <laughs> transcending what they call identity <coughs> politics. Uh, and, uh, and this has been celebrated as if we don't need reservation anymore. We don't need special minority rights provisions anymore. Chacha committee was a vote bank politics. Women's reservation is a, uh, a sectional uh, identity and so on. Um, so the um, the strategy of capital, its epistemology, its media, and state power, states' ability to give you those special programs, to keep you separate and not interconnect, to keep you competing with sectional identities, uh, is so great that intersectionality uh, has been difficult. Uh, I mean, uh, you know, capital instead of cementing and creating a market actually uses this very uh, imaginatively, I would say, to uh, divide. Uh, and this has been a very difficult uh, thing. Finally, I, th I think this is a uh, this is uh, something that renews the DCRC mandate. I think. Those who are seeing for the first time today would, would uh, relate to our, you know, 30-year-old effort. And uh, this is the project, precisely, uh, you know, liberating uh, knowledge from uh, the power structures. You know, politics of knowledge has been what has been the main uh, main mission of uh, our interdisciplinary group, and uh, we are really grateful to. Uh, to, uh, to have really ignited this enthusiasm for them. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, just by way of conclusion, um, on behalf of uh, the Developing Countries Research Center, um, I thank you very much for the to Mrs. Santos for really agreeing at a fairly short notice to come and do this lecture, but it's been really invigorating for us. Um, and uh, we departed from tradition and had a question-answer session, which I think is a very good idea. I'm glad you did that. We had it many times. 
Um, Mom, that is a question. I can give you a <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Obviously, I've forgotten the ones in which we had questions. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, indeed, I mean, I think uh, it's, uh, it's better this way, certainly. And uh, I would especially like to thank um, most of the audience also came at very short notice, actually. And uh, so it's wonderful that so many of uh, you have come for the first time to the DCRC. Some have left, those who have come for the first time. And it's uh, wonderful that you could come and participate. And I hope that uh, you return uh, and uh, we can do other uh, programs. So thank you all. Uh, and thank you, Professor Mahanti, for being here. Mahanti for being here. Because that's a special privilege for us. I know you said we departed, but this was not the tradition and so on. But um, uh, it's been a huge inspiration for this place. So that it makes a lot of difference about us to have him here. Thank you, everyone, and we can finally say goodbye.